Chief Dan Lipsky began his career with the Boston Police Department in 1986 and rose through the ranks before being promoted to the rank of Superintendent in Chief, the highest four member of the Boston Police Department. Among his many accomplishments, Chief Lipsky helped guide the Boston Police Department to a 30% reduction in apartment crimes over seven years. Chief Lipsky was the executive director who oversaw the development and implementation of the region's first ever multi-jurisdictional, multi-discipline exercise, Urban Shield Boston, which were critical in preparing Boston's first responders to respond to the Boston Marathon bombings on April 15th. He was awarded the Boston Police Medal of Honor, which he was a three-time recipient, recipient of the Hannah Medal, Hannah Medal of Valor, which is Massachusetts' highest law enforcement award, American Legion Medal of Valor, the American Police Officer Association Medal of Valor, <coughs> 2013 Semper Fidelis Society and Semper Fi Marine of the Year Award. He has earned an international reputation at planning and overseeing special events. He has lectured and consulted police officials and emergency management officials in the United States and abroad on special event management and planning. Please help me welcome Chief Dan Minsky. Up when I'll just um, talk without a mic. So usually I can project my voice pretty good. It's my honor and privilege to be here. Jenna, I want to thank you for allowing me to be here, and Billy Senate for getting me here. I'm um, actually, uh, this is home for me. Uh, literally, I live two streets away. And, um, I'm a graduate, class of 97 at Curry College. Uh, it looks like we're ready to run. So I'm a recovering police officer. Uh, I was a police officer for 28 years and uh, started at the age of 19. Uh, and that's, that's what I wanted to do. That's what I always wanted to be. Um, there was a reason I wanted to be a police officer. Uh, my dad died young. And one of the role models in my life was a gentleman named Jeremiah J. Curley, my best friend's dad. Uh, Jerry was a big, strong, strapping cop. And I wanted to be a Boston cop. And I get to live that dream. And Jerry really was there when I pinned my badge on my chest. Um, and I get the privilege of working with Jerry for several years. Uh, new directions in violence prevention. So restarting the community police dialogue post-Ferguson. And that's what I was told my talk was supposed to be. And how did I get post-Ferguson? Um, so I retired from BPD. I have my own consulting company. I consult with uh, locations and facilities on the security plan. I do management consulting. Uh, I work for the Department of Justice as one of my clients. Uh, one of my projects has been to go to Ferguson and uh, see what was going on out there, right? The good, the bad, the ugly. I just submitted a report to the Attorney General of the United States, of which I cannot comment on uh, <laughs> until she approves it. Um, I've been asked to go to Baltimore and do some work for the Department of Justice in there. I have a client at the State Department. I train law enforcement around the globe in major event incidents, investigations. And that's a unique experience. So you, you've got some people uh, who have master's degree in education that are law enforcement leaders in other places in the globe. And then I teach the Mali Police Department how to do a major investigation. And the Mali Police Chief is just trying to figure out how to get shoes for the majority of his police officers. Um, so we're in a pretty good place in, in, uh, in America. Although we definitely need to have a conversation about where we are in policing in the United States. Uh, it is no better time to be retired from policing uh, right now, has anyone seen a YouTube video of a firefighter or, or a TV show where people were had experts talking about the firefighter using the inappropriate amount of water on fire? Has anyone seen a, a TV show where they called in and talked about you know the, the inappropriate uh, use of uh, lactated ringers by a nurse or a doctor at the ER? Has anyone seen a TV show or a news clip where someone has commented on Boston police or some other police agency around the country? on how they handle the situation. The police also winds up on YouTube, oftentimes because they deserve to be on YouTube, because they want professional or outside they train. Uh, but uh, do we have individuals in law enforcement to let us down? Yes, we do. Because we're drifting human rights. Yeah. And we ask them to do things that aren't human. Um, so I was going to change the talk to, should we change this title to Post Cleveland? where a 12-year-old boy was shot with a ballot gun. Uh, that's a huge problem, right? If you think any of those police officers left their house that day and said, you know what, I'm just itching to shoot a 12-year-old kid 
with gun guns. And uh, line myself up on national news and probably look at criminal prosecution. This is this is what I hope to happen today. I, I don't think that conversation occurred. Should we change it to post New York? Whether it's Eric Gardner or whether this gentleman who, by all accounts, the officer's account and everyone's account, the officer, uh, an untrained, unexperienced officer, shot this man in the hallway for no reason. Um, do we need to talk about that? Or should we maybe call it post South Carolina? And this was not my nightmare. Because I have a lot of community meetings where my police officers have used force to defend themselves and to defend the community they protect. And they've taken lives. And I've had a strong, tough, hard-nosed police officer cry on my shoulder, begging me to get Father Sean so he could go to confession because he had to kill someone. And I went to a community meeting where the family of that subject who ran for my officer, had a long history of violence, was a subject in another homicide, pointed a gun six feet away from my officer's face, and my officer discharged one round from his weapon and took his life because he had to. Because you've asked him to do that. That's what our community has asked our officers to do, to stand up against those who engage in violence. And if they engage in violence and threaten your life or the life of the officers, the officers can defend themselves. You wouldn't believe the number of police reports I read every day, or used to read every day, of police officers who were tackling people with guns, who were shooting at other people, when if they went by their training, they should have shot them. Uh, that's a phenomenon that happens more in the Northeast in policing than it does out in the West and uh, in, in the South of, of uh, American policing. I watched this video because I want community meetings, and even though I saw the videotape and, and had witnesses, in this particular case, I had a public defender who saw it, and then she saw the officer crying and giving CPR to the gentleman he shot. Uh, she was a witness to it. But I go to the community meeting and they would say, you shot him in the back for no reason. And I would say, you know, come on, that just didn't happen. That just would never happen. And I watched this South Carolina video and said, my God, it happened. How did that happen? Why did that happen? Does he know what he's done to that gentleman and his family? Does he know what he's done to my cops and cops across this country? He just made everyone's job a thousand percent more difficult. And all the good work we've done over the number of years, all the relationship we built, we've thrown out the window in a second. Should this conversation be post South Carolina? Or should this conversation be post Baltimore? Where an entire city burned. Or should this conversation be about post New York? Where because of the outrage, justified or unjustified, but because of the outrage, because of the feelings, because of the commentary, because of comments, because of mental health issues, an individual went online and said he was going to put wigs on pigs. And he executed two police officers protecting their community. Should this be the conversation? Or should it be the conversation of Brian Moore, who was trying to take a felon off the street who had a firearm, because that's what the citizens of New York have asked him to do. If you see people out here engaged in firearm violence, we want you, officer, to get them. And that's what he was doing. And as a result, he was shot in the face. Maybe, maybe we should stop the conversation from that end. Or maybe it's post-Mississippi. Just the other day, two young police officers murdered for doing their job. Could never happen in Boston. Maybe it's post Boston. Yeah. I want the handcuff situation. I want the handcuff situation. No, no, no. He asked. The 
guy's getting off the off the car and he sucked you up soon in the face. I heard you guys cuffed him after he was clearly crying. And you kept him, he remained he remained cuffed. I'm supposed to be so, after shots was exchanged. So that's that's training. I didn't know that. I wasn't here for that. So that's that's what happened. You see, you know that answers? Oh, I just told you what happened, right? But you as much as I know, I came back to get free. And that's it. Why can you see the body? I came because here's why. Let's go. Don't go, man. If there's deceased, the body's deceased on the scene, it comes under the jurisdiction of the district attorney's office and can't be removed until the district attorney gives his say so. With the medical examiner, that's all. And while they are covered by by a screen, trying to be respectful, so that um, nobody could look in, it won't upset the neighborhood, cover the fire. That's it. But it's not it's not under my jurisdiction after that. It has to be under under the, the district attorney, okay. right, and the medical examiner. Last thing. Right. So John Brown, I just addressed him over there. He came up. Right. Call me a fool to my face and then push the tape. Hat. All the officers attack us and push us back. What you gonna do about that? I didn't see it. We got footage. We got footage. We got footage. The officers put their hands on all of us. What you gonna do about it? So, go through the internal affairs. Internal affairs? No, you got the. You got the. What do you want me to do? I got the man scene. Man. You better tell me what you're gonna do about that. I'm not going to man scene. Fuck man scene. Yeah. What you gonna do about that? Well, Your officers put their hands on me tonight. Well, you show me. I'm not for it. Listen, listen. All right, so bring it. Say no more. Say no more. Say no more. No, bring it. No, say no more. No, conversation over. I don't even fucking know why they're screwing. They don't even fucking attend. Why are you not disrespectful? You said bring it, so I'm bringing it. I said bring it. No, so we bring it. So we bring it. Go back to shit, kids. Go back to shit, kids. You're laughing. I'm going to say that young man is ignorant, uneducated, no access to resources. He goes to Harvard. Willie Gross grew up a couple blocks, that chief of police grew up a couple blocks away from that scene. I stood on that street corner where a young girl was killed, 12 years old, Dolly Tiffany Moore, sitting on a mailbox years before. Young police officer named Dan Linsky had thrown off the mailbox 20 minutes before she was shot and killed because I saw the gang kids she was saying with I knew it was going to be problems. And unfortunately, she came back to that mailbox. So as far as we are in Boston, we are far ahead of a lot of police departments with a lot of community relations. We still have some work to do. But I guess if you knew what it was like to be a cop, because people try to kill us, then maybe people would understand a little bit. These are the deaths this year, 44 line of duty deaths, 10 by gunfire. 10 by gunfire, that's what we go to work with. That's why we get frustrated. How, how come the community gets frustrated? I mean, don't they know what we do? October 28, 1991, I responded um, to a scene for an officer down. Um, it was an uh, officer from our bomb squad who was examining a package. That package exploded. I, I went to that scene and I held the officers and we picked up literally the pieces of that officer. His name is Jeremiah J. Hurley. My best friend's dad. The reason I became a cop. He rolled into the Brigham Women's Hospital. My wife was the nurse. They worked with a very talented trauma team. And Jerry died after about six and a half hours. So if people want to criticize me, maybe they should walk in my shoes. Public needs to see these events from the eyes of the police. But police need to see these events from the eyes of the public. 412 people have been killed since January 1st in engagements with law enforcement. Gunfire, tasers, <coughs> physical assaults, deaths in custody. That's an average of 95 of our citizens are killed in confrontation with law enforcement a month. 23.908, that's 3.1 a day. I found that stat doing research for this, and I was dumbfounded. I pay attention to the news. I've watched the high-profile events. I think I could probably count and give you the names. You know, maybe two hands. 412? Is there any reason to 
citizens are frustrated with law enforcement? Yeah, I think there is. I think there is. There are now two conversations going on in America. And we as police officers have the ability to take life and liberty. So not only can we kill you, and you've told us we can do that. The citizens of America have told police you have the authority to kill to defend us and yourselves. But we also have the authority to take liberty. 12,408,899 arrested in 2011. But I mean, we got bad guys off the street, right? We arrested bad guys. We've helped neighborhoods by getting those bad guys off the street. We always get our guy, except the work of the Innocence Project will tell you that 329 of those guys were the wrong guy. Imagine spending 14 years on average in prison for a crime you didn't commit. Because eyewitnesses make a bad identification even though they think they did the right thing. The science is improper or, or documented. False confessions or admissions. Inadequate defense attorneys. Performance who have an obligation to protect themselves is a lie. And believe it or not, government misconduct. Believe it or not, government misconduct. Police officers who don't obey the oath they took. How does this human trust play out in our communities? Danny Conley was here earlier. He was with me when mistrust played out for me one night. I was with him, actually. He's got a nice cottage up in New York Beach, Maine. I just bought a pool full of steaks and beer. <laughs> and that night, I got a page, which is something I don't miss, that there was a young child shot a playground in our city. And I left New York Beach and drove 100 miles an hour down there to get there. And the story I got was that there was a young boy shot in a park. And there were two to three hundred people in the park. My police officers rushed into that park towards the sound of that gun fire, like they do every day. And they went and did first aid on the child. And they saved that child's life, along with our very talented medical personnel and doctors here in Boston. And they asked the 250 people in a park who have a vested interest and letting us know who did the shooting, who shot him. And people wouldn't tell them. In fact, they told them things like, I'm not going to tell you. Hmm. Why? Why would you allow that? What kind of person would allow somebody to terrorize a neighborhood and shoot a little baby while I'm in the park with my kids and they won't cooperate with us. What is wrong with those people? Well, maybe they're afraid. Maybe they're afraid. And if they live in a neighborhood where there's a gang over here and a gang over here, and those gangs go at each other all the time, and they're here by themselves with their family doing their thing, and they get along with everybody, do they really want to rock the boat and become the center of attention? And they're legitimately afraid. Or they mistrust the police because of something we've done in the past. Or something they perceive we've done or read that we've done. Whether it's good information or bad information, but they mistrust the police. So what happens is you get an us versus them. And that can be black, white, poor, rich, powerful, powerless. But you get a cop who day after day goes into those parks and says, who shot the little boy? I'm not going to tell you anything. Screw you. You're responsible for this violence. I'm not going to tell you anything. You be that community member who gets violated, gets stopped walking down the street because of the color of their skin, gets their car pulled over for no reason other than the fact that, well, I didn't think you could own this car. Has their pockets turned inside out with an appropriate probable cause? Has excessive force used on them during the course of arrest? And we begin a conversation of us versus them. And we got to start having a conversation together about all of us. You know, stop snitching. Hey, I know a snitch. Okay, so to me, the snitch is the guy on the left, right? Maybe you can identify him. He's got some pretty uh, covert uh, <laughs> systems on him. The woman who sees the guy breaking into my neighbor's house and calls 911, when I grew up, we would call you a good neighbor. That's not a snitch. 
You're not getting out of your, we didn't do something together and you sit down and say, okay, I'll tell you the whole thing. Gabe did it, the staff did it themselves. That's a snitch. Calling 911 about who shot a child, that's being a good community member. Two conversations have got to start to occur. And let me tell you the conversations going on in police departments around America right now. Your police officers, when they go to roll call, when they're having lunch, in guard rooms and in cruises, are saying, hey buddy, I gotta tell you, do nothing and do it well. Because all I have to do as a Boston police officer is answer that radio call and write a report. I don't have to arrest anybody. There is no requirement except under very few circumstances where a police officer must make an arrest. I don't have to get out of the car and be proactive trying to prevent any shootings. I know the young woman who spoke at Great Women's Hospital spoke very passionately about that young man in the ICU. And that was obviously a bad experience for him being, she said, interrogated, I'll call interview by the police. We all see things our own way. But if those cops could identify where that gunshot came from, they probably could re prevent retaliatory shooting that is most likely to come. And understanding that on the other side of the house, not just looking to a police officer's eyes, the community understanding why we do what we do and how we do it is important. Cops are saying, you're going to get killed, you're going to get injured, you're going to get wrongly disciplined, they're going to fire you, they're going to charge you criminally, you're going to go to jail, they're going to kill you in the media. Jesse Jackson called me a jackbooted racist thug. He's never met me. It was in response to a news report about a case I was involved with as a young police officer. Jesse Jackson called me a jack of racist thug, and I vowed when I ever met him, I would straighten him out. <laughs> and he came into the convention center, and in those box when I was providing security, the door opened, and he had his hand shut up before him, and before he went, I was shaking his hand, but I didn't get a chance to talk to him. <laughs> Family threatened to hurt. Occupy Boston, they were kind enough to uh, put all my personal information, my kids' personal information on the web. Threatened to blow up my wife and children. Uh, and police don't have the same rights as others, let's be clear. Our job is to make sure your rights are protected. We don't have the same rights. I have a police officer who sent a racist note to a rooster paper report. He has every right to say and write everything he does, what he wants to do. He just doesn't have a right to be a Boston police officer, so we fired him. Other jobs, you can say what you want to do. You can, I, I can, as a pro-Catholic, uh, feel what I wouldn't want to feel about abortion. And yet I was standing on the front line of an abortion clinic to protect the rights of those who have the opposite view. Because I don't have the choice as a police officer to take sides. I enforce the law. Cops are having those conversations that's very dangerous. You do not want them to not be proactive. You do not want them going after the kids who are about to engage in gun violence, retaliatory violence. You do not want them just responding to 911 calls and writing reports. And that's all we can make them do. And there's kids in those guard rooms who are saying to those officers, they're saying, do nothing, do it well, officers. They're saying, a lot of good people out here. It's not what I signed up for. I'm going to do my job. I'm going to do the job every day. Community is saying, you know what? I'm tired of these racist cops. Cops are liars. Cops are thieves. Cops create crime. Could you imagine saying cops create crime? People would tell me that we were part of the Irish Mafia. Where would they get that? Would infuriate me. Irish Mafia, where do you get that? Like, like there's some guy named James Whitey Bulger in South Boston, we had an Irish Mafia who had, I, I guess he did have an FBI agent, the two that. Well, it, it was the state troopers who were giving him our wiretap information when my officers and I were actually trying to get a case against them. All there were those pesky Boston cops, too, that were taking bribes from him. So, I guess that's true. <laughs> cops don't care about them. Cops beat people for no reason. Cops are incompetent. Cops get away with abuse involving murder. And it's us versus them. We have to stop the conversations in both areas of us versus them. We're in this together. Sir Robin Peel, the father of one day policing. Police are the public, and the public are the police. We need the consent of the public for legitimacy to police you. 
that do not occur without your consent. And you, you need us on that wall. You want us on that wall. If I take a line from a few good men, right? Where do we go from here? Well, I think we need more forms like this. We need to change the way we train our police officers. So I read the academy, top of my class. I can tell you, chapter in section 266.22, break an engine, do a chicken coop, it's a five-year felony. <laughs> this, you break a chicken coop, it's a felony, five years. The owner of the chicken coop can hold you in a place of disobedience. And go ahead and law students, you criminal justice, go ahead and Google this. Place of disobedience for up to 48 hours a weekend. So you can lock you in the chicken coop. <laughs> so, it's a felony. You punch a cop in the nose and break his nose, it's a misdemeanor. <laughs> Well, uh, but I learned all those statutes, and I learned I could arrest for this, I could not arrest for this, I could arrest for this, I could arrest for this. And then what I would do is I would go to roll call, and I'd get my police car, and what I would do is what I thought they wanted me to do, because that's what my bosses told me to do. That's what, when I went to community meetings, they say, well, why don't you guys arrest more people? So I would try and go up and arrest somebody before going Ocean R, and the car next to me would do the same thing. And I'd get somebody with 15 bags of dope, they get somebody with 20 bags of dope, oh, next week I'll get the Oops. Next week, I'll get the five bags to go more. And we were trying to make as many arrests as possible because that's what they trained us to do. Did that, did that help? Did I quell narcotics in Massachusetts? No, I think I feel miserable with our opiate epidemic that's going on here. So we would, Dominic Tiffany Moore is in. Our response is get them. Go out there and get them. Show those kids who's in charge, lock them up. So we go up and block people up for marijuana cigarettes or expired licenses. But we wanted to show the community they were taking it seriously. And we would send 50 cops up there on overtime and we'd lock them up. You know the gang kids who were involved in gun violence? They kind of knew we were coming. They weren't dumb. So they put their heads down, they'd go out of town. And we would lock up Ed, the electrician, who's got two kids. He's trying to put through school. He's got a suspended license because he hasn't had a chance to take care of the broken tail light and the, the ticket that he got. But he had a suspended license, so we locked him up because he was a staff. And we would write the traffic citations because those were staffs. We'd show that we were doing, hey, we got pro we're doing overtime up here, we got approved community, we're doing something, let's write tickets. So we'd write tickets and we'd arrest people. And we'd FIO kids, we'd stop them and FIO. Um, make sure that we take their information down. And we only got 50 FIOs, five arrests, and 50 tickets. Wow, you did your job tonight. And none of it impacted violence in the neighborhood. And in fact, we infuriated the neighborhood. Because we didn't police it, we were occupying it. We changed that strategy with uh, Commissioner Davis. We put police officers, supervisors, and six officers. We kept them in the same neighborhoods. They didn't run from fire to fire. Um, just trying to check my time here. We didn't run from crisis to crisis. Uh, we kept them problem solving, working with the community, getting to know who the good people were, how to develop relationships. Because we all have a vested interest in getting rid of those violent kids and not arresting any electricians because he has a license. There's some, some of the Curry kids here in the back. Your Curry student, raise your hand. Okay. Who is Alvin Bolimo? Any idea? No. Rodney King? Any idea? No. <laughs> So Admiral Lima was an African-American male who was mistaken as somebody who assaulted a police officer. And a police officer in New York, and I'm very proud to be a police officer. The police officer in New York arrested him, brought him to the police station, and sodomized him with a billy club. And the fact that we don't know his name, the fact that my police officers in the academy, the new young recruits don't know his name, is a travesty. And if they don't understand the history that brought them to this point, the reason there's tensions between police and community, then they're going to be behind the eight ball. We should be teaching our cops about history. How we got here. What happened and why. We should be teaching police officers de-escalation strategies. There's a study up here, 21 feet. If you've got a knife, I've got a knife. I can take a knife and stab you from 21 feet away before you can get your gun out of your holster. So what that meant for police officers, okay, he's got a knife, he's in, I guess I can shoot him, because that's what the law says, it's the law, 21 feet, he's within 21 feet, he's got a knife, I can shoot him. I can't tell you the number of times I have fought with somebody who had a knife or a gun when I would have been justified in shooting him, but I didn't do it. 
And we often have bad tactics in law enforcement that put officers in situations where they are justified in doing the shoot. But if they had used bad tactics or they used other equipment, they might have been able to prevent it. People don't like tasers. Um, and there's some problems with tasers. Tasers have a 60% reduction in officers' injuries, 60% reduction in complaints, and a 40% reduction in injury prisoners. Because just the threat of a taser sometimes gets people to comply. My cops, I can say to them, look, if there's a guy in there with a machine gun, I want you to smash this door and I want you to run in with your gun uh, and engage him in activity and, and handcuff him. And they go, okay, boss, well, just one guy with guns, that's it. You can't find me four or five because I'm ready. And they have no problem doing that. I say to them, hey, do me a favor, I want you to go to the community and have a mission help. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. So I send a kid, I want you to go to the, the community meeting. Okay, sir, got it. And I showed the community meeting, and uh, I got there in the back of the room. Here's the officer in the back of the room. And I said, what are you doing? Sir, I'm guarding the meeting. I thought you told me to guard the meeting. <laughs> no, I want you to be in the meeting. I want you to engage. The, you like, have a conversation with people. Learn to eat. Oh, I don't, I don't know if I'm comfortable doing that. We teach our cops how to talk to bad guys all the time. We blade ourselves. We look for weapons. We look for characteristics. We don't teach them how to talk to good citizens. How to engage people. My safe street program, we got cops, the first stage we got invisible in the neighborhoods. And then I would walk in the neighborhoods and I would say, Do you see the police officers on here? But yeah, they park the car there and they, they hang on the car. They're here, they're here about five or six hours every day. They're parking in the car. Okay, step one. Good, we got them at least in the neighborhood. <laughs> so step two, I have my supervisors and I tell them, You gotta get out. You gotta walk, you gotta, you gotta get out of the car, you gotta walk. So step two, about six months later, I go and say, Do you see the police officers? Oh, yeah. Are they out of the car? Yeah, they're out of the car. They stand right here, they walk here, they're up there. Up and down the streets, they're always walking here, Chief. Great, we've got it. Do you know any of their names? No? No, they don't come in, they don't talk to us. No, we just, we just But they walk. They walk the heck out of the window. So we gotta teach our cops how to engage good citizens, how to build relationships with people who could help them. That kid who shot the little boy in the car, we never had a witness to come forward and charge him with that shooting. But I walked that neighborhood. And so did some of my better detectives. And I had a woman say, thank you very much for what you do, I appreciate it. You know, you're a, hey, you were very helpful. I remember you when you were in the narcotics unit. Hey, you know who it was? And I can never testify, but it was so-and-so. So I put a narcotics squad on so-and-so, and a firearms trafficking squad on so-and-so, and we brought drugs off of so-and-so, and we kept buying drugs off of so-and-so, until he sold us enough drugs, we put him into a mandatory 10-year prison sentence, which is probably more time than he would have got to shoot the little boy. So we fix that problem a different way. We've got to get our cops. Do you guys have a lot of nurses, doctors, and us? Do you, you, have, you have continuing education, don't you? You have to get so many CEUs to keep your license? Yeah, no, we don't do that. In fact, you keep funding the continuing education program for law enforcement across the country. How many police officers would benefit from this conversation today? Frontline cops and cruisers. To know the resources that are available when they're frustrated with kids that are runaways or addiction. Or we're trying to deal with people. Boy, we should really change the way we train our police. We gotta change the way we occupy our neighborhoods, we gotta utilize intelligence and technology, and we have to be transparent. When people try to turn John Monaghan shooting into what it wasn't, it was a police officer doing his job, who was shot in the line of duty. When they try to turn it into something else, put the camera on us and look at the video. And trusted members of the community come out and say, no. We stand with the police. This is exactly what we want them to do. We need more of that law enforcement as much as we can. So that's what police are going to do. What are you going to do? Right, what are politicians going to do? What are community groups going to do? What are unions going to do? Religious leaders, judges, defense attorneys, healthcare providers, federal, state, college, universities. Let's talk to the kids. We're, 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 we're the gang of all kids. <laughs> Don't I have a conference? <laughs> Do you think we should engage the ones we're making decisions about in the conversation? I do. I do. The good and the bad kids. Um, I've been very successful in my law enforcement career, made a lot of great arrests. 
a lot of great relationships, and it's because I followed that model that my great uh, mentor, Kate Linsky, told me. Treat people the way you want to be treated, and you'll do okay. That's what I got for you. I'm going to be hanging around and be happy to take questions. I know we're tight for time. Um, Jen, anyone have a question at the end? Yeah.